Here's a graph of the coefficient of drag as a function of Reynolds number for fluid flowing over a sphere. And we've got two different cases. One, the upper case with a small Reynolds number, and the lower case with a large Reynolds number. These experimental results are independent of the diameter of the sphere, the viscosity of the fluid, etc. For example, the case on the left, it might be the upper case, it might be some small Reynolds number. And in the lower case, it might be some large Reynolds number. And if we know the Reynolds number, we immediately know the coefficient of drag. And it's powerful because we've combined all these different parameters, the diameter of the sphere, the viscosity, and the density of the fluid onto one single curve. And it does work, but the question is, how could you figure out beforehand to organize the data in terms of the Reynolds number and the coefficient of drag? So to figure out these dimensionless parameters, we'll use what's known as the Buckingham Pi theorem. And the first step, which is often the hardest step, is to choose variables or parameters that may affect the experimental results. And this is challenging because it's hard to see it at the beginning. So what we ultimately want to measure is the force of drag and the parameters that might affect it. You know, I would say the velocity of the fluid would affect it, the viscosity of the fluid, the density of the fluid, and I would also expect that the diameter of the sphere would affect the uh, experimental results or affect the force. So then you count up the number of variables that you would believe that would affect the experimental results. And this number of variables, we call it, give it the variable name k. And in this case, k is equal to 5 because we have 5 variables. The second step is to choose what are known as repeating variables for the analysis. And when you select these variables, don't include what's known as the dependent variable. So in this case, our dependent variable would be the force of drag. So we can choose whatever we want. Let's choose the diameter of the sphere, the velocity of the fluid, and the fluid density as our repeating variables. Third step is to count the number of dimensions that we need to consider. So we'll have dimensions of mass, for example, and the density of mass in the numerator, or kilograms per cubic meter. We've got length, of course, because it describes the diameter. And we've also got a dimension of time in our analysis. So velocity is length per unit time. We've got three dimensions. In this case, r, the number of dimensions that we need, are three. And step four is to calculate the number of pi terms that these relationships could be reduced to. So in this case, the Buckingham pi theorem, it says the number of pi terms is k minus r, in this case, 5 minus 3, and that equals 2. And in this case, what we'll find is that the first pi term is the Reynolds number, and the second pi term is the coefficient of drag. And the fifth step is to actually form the different pi terms. To do that, we're going to say pi 1 is equal, let's use one of our non-repeating variables, the viscosity, and we'll say viscosity times diameter to the a power, velocity to the b power, and the density to the c power. And our goal is to rearrange these to figure out exponents a, b, and c such that there are no dimensions for this pi term. And these three parameters are what's known as our repeating variables. So we'll repeat these three when we calculate the second pi term say the dimensions of viscosity are units of mass per length time. The dimensions of diameter is length, and we're going to raise this to the a power. The dimensions of velocity, meters per second, or length per time, raised to the b power. And the dimensions of density are mass, mass per length cube, and that's raised to the c power. So for each of these dimensions, we can write an equation Let's look at mass, for example. We want, in our pi term, to have dimensions of mass to the zero power. So we've got mass in the first term. We've got mass in the numerator of 1. And there's nothing in this term, this term. But in the density, we've got mass raised to the c power. And let's do the same thing for the length. Again, we want no dimensions of length. In the first term, the viscosity, we've got length scaled to the negative 1 power. And in the diameter, scaled, we'll say, the a power, plus b for velocity. And we've got length to the negative 3c power. We'll do the same thing for time, negative 1 and negative b. We've got a series of three equations and three unknowns. 
And what we find, c is equal to negative 1, a is equal to negative 1, and b is equal to negative 1. So if we write this out, pi 1 is equal to the viscosity divided by the product of the diameter, the velocity, and the density. So make sure we're doing it right. This better be a dimensionless term. So we've got in the numerator kilograms per meter second for viscosity, 1 over meters for diameter in the denominator. We've got seconds per meter, the inverse of the velocity, and finally meters cubed per kilogram kilograms cancel out, seconds cancel out. We've got meters cubed in the denominator and meters cubed in the numerator and we've indeed done this right and we get a dimensionless number for pi 1. And it turns out because it's dimensionless we can calculate pi 1 prime for example and we could say that pi 1 prime is simply equal to 1 over pi 1 and it's equal to rho v d over mu and this actually has a name, it's known as the Reynolds number. And to find the second pi term, I can do something similar, except instead of using the viscosity, I'm now using the force. And here's my other three repeating variables, d, v, and rho raised to each exponent. Here is dimensions of force, or mass length per time squared, diameter is length, velocity length per time, and so on for the density. And I'll do the same thing, write out three algebraic equations according to the dimensions and what I come up with is that c is equal to negative 1, a is equal to negative 2, and b is equal to negative 2. So using these exponents I can write pi 2 is equal to the force divided by the diameter squared, velocity squared, multiplied by the density. It turns out we can say the area is simply pi over 4 times d squared, or we could rearrange that and say d squared is 4 over pi times the area. We don't care about this 4 over pi, all we care about are the dimensionless groups. And because of this constant doesn't affect the scaling, we'll just say it's pi 2 prime, and what you'll see is that it's characterized as a force divided by 1 half times the projected area times the velocity squared times the density. And when it's written this way, it's, this pi 2 prime is known as the coefficient of drag. So again, if we've done it right, force of drag would be kilogram meters per second squared. We've got 1 over a, or 1 over meters squared, and velocity squared, second squared per meter squared, and the density meters cubed per kilogram and the kilograms again fall out, seconds squared will fall out. We've got meters to the fourth in both the numerator and the denominator, and indeed the coefficient of drag is dimensionless. So if we made a graph of this, this is the original graph that you've seen, the, we've got pi 2 prime is the coefficient of drag, pi 1 is the Reynolds number, and what that means is that the coefficient of drag is a function of the Reynolds number, in the Reynolds number only. So for all those different geometries, all those different fluids, all you need to know is the Reynolds number, some experimental data, and that will give you the coefficient of drag.